When Australia separated from Gondwana ages ago, its animal species were isolated from the rest of the world. Not quite all of them, though. Birds could still fly between the land masses. Giant birds called moas developed in these jungles where food was abundant and there were few predators. Some of them weighed as much as 550 pounds. This is a distant relative of those birds. This brush turkey, or pouched taligala, is hard at work. A kangaroo is watching him, but the bird is too busy to notice. These Australian turkeys are anything but lazy. The taligala is polygamous and has to provide a place for his females to lay their eggs. He's building a very unusual nest. The turkey gathers together leaves and other plant materials to build his love nest. That's a nest? <laughs> yes, it is. And some may weigh as much as four tons. That turkey's got himself quite a job to do. It works like this. The turkey gathers all the leaves he can. Then fungus grows among them and they decompose. This process of decomposition produces heat, which turns the nest into a real incubator. The incubator always has to be between 30 and 35 degrees Celsius. To take the temperature of the nest, the turkey has a thermometer in his tongue or in his beak. We don't really know. And here he is, deep sea diving in a sea of leaves, all in the name of reproduction. A very original system. After a few go-rounds, scientists have decided that, evolutionarily speaking, these turkeys are very close relatives of the reptiles, since only these birds and reptiles use this system of heated nests. It's a curious case, but whatever it takes to reproduce, And from here, I go to Africa, where some tribes hunt in a very unusual way. We're in Borgo, in northern Benin, between Nigeria and Togo, home of the Bariba and Beta Maribe groups of the Somba people, one of Africa's oldest tribes. Formerly hunters, today they also grow crops and keep livestock. But hunting is still more for them than just a way to acquire food. They hunt in small groups led by a chief. Their arrowheads are treated with strophanthus, a deadly poison that they get from a plant. Once a year, in May, a number of tribes come together for the hunt. The hunters set out from their different villages, playing their flutes and their beaded rattles. The Council of Elders selects a meeting place. The hunt is very important for the Somba people. They hunt to eat and to demonstrate their courage and intelligence. Special powers are attributed to the hunters, particularly to the chiefs, who have the ability to neutralize the animals that they are going to hunt. When everything is ready, they'll give the order to set out. No one knows how long they will be in the bush, and the hunt may sometimes last for weeks.
The Bariba use hunting lures. Of all the Somba groups, they have the most ingenious hunting techniques. They hunt antelopes, zebras, monkeys, elephants, buffalo, and all kinds of birds. This camouflaged hunter moves silently across the land. He knows the terrain and the behavior of his prey intimately. If luck smiles on them and they take down a large animal, they will carry it back home to cut into pieces and share all around. Forest rangers allow the Bariba to hunt, but not the poachers, who use rifles rather than arrows and sell ivory and tusks on the black market. Here, there are both responsible and irresponsible hunters. And from here to the Caribbean. In addition to its gorgeous beaches, the Caribbean island of Cuba has other less known features, such as this mangrove swamp. The word mangrove comes from a Guarani word meaning twisted tree. Underwater, mangrove roots look like a twisted mass of vegetation. The many roots stabilize the sand and mud. Ocean water and fresh water mix here. The mix is full of nutrients, fish and crustaceans. Plants have adapted to the lack of oxygen and easily reproduce, turning the swamp's floor into a tangle of vegetation. The area under the water is a labyrinth and above the surface it's an aquatic jungle. Many other leafy and woody plants thrive in addition to the mangroves. This is a habitat for great quantities of vegetation and many animals as well. A snake slithers along a mangrove limb. Is he looking for some eggs for breakfast? Or for a distracted rodent for an appetizer? These mangroves develop in a very individual fashion. Their seeds are long and pointed, and when they drop, they have several options. They may float away, germinate, or grow roots to sink into the swamp floor. It looks very peaceful here, but it's not. To birds, the mangrove swamp seems like a peaceful place to nest, especially if they eat fish. Many animals live off the mangrove's leaves and fruit. I'm looking carefully for anything that moves in the treetops and anything that may emerge from under the water. This is a Cuban or Desmarais sutia, and this is a boa. And these floating tree trunks with eyes are mangrove crocodiles. I'm out of here. I'm in Peru, in these rugged mountains full of vegetation, cliffs and mountain streams. We're looking for the city of the clouds, where the Chachapoyas live. It's more a fortress than a city. A fortress at an altitude of 9,850 feet. The wall is 2,000 feet long. I walk its length amazed and somewhat seasick.
It's rectangular, built on a base of limestone and covers an area of 15 acres. How could this city have been inhabited by the cloud warriors, light-skinned and handsome Indians, said by Spanish chroniclers, to have been exceptionally stubborn and courageous? They were not only courageous, but also unconquered until the Incas cut off their supplies of food and water. Even then, the Chachapoyas held out for months before they surrendered. Inside the walls, Quelap is a city of round houses with unusual conical roofs. As we approach the innermost enclaves of the Chachapoyas and their cliffside tombs, the atmosphere turns otherworldly and supernatural. More than 100 mummies have been found at the sacred mountain cliffs of La Bedaga. The atmosphere here is surreal. How did they bury their dead on these inaccessible cliffs? We have no idea. It's hard to imagine. Nevertheless, the mummies are perfectly preserved. If a mummy can be considered perfect, that is. The sarcophagi of Karajia contain many Chachapoya mummies. The secrets of these statues that gaze off into space are another mystery that has yet to be explained. They are a real challenge to archaeologists, and to me they are inexplicable. I'm flabbergasted. There are those who say that these handsome Indians had European origins. European extraterrestrials? A Spanish lagoon called Via Fafila also holds many secrets. Every year it is visited by migratory birds that pass through here on the way to Extremadura and Andalucía. I had never heard the expression, whoop like a crane. But it's common if you spend any time with ornithologists. And indeed, the birds do call loudly when they sight the lagoon. I thought it was from joy, but from what I've seen, they do it in order to stay together. About a thousand cranes stop over here for several weeks. They find everything they need, especially food in the form of plant stems, small animals and tasty bulbs. When autumn ends, they'll again take flight to spend the winter in Extremadura and Andalucía. But cranes aren't the only ones to visit Mia Fafila. Naturalists, a few tourists and the simply curious also come here at the end of September when the sky is full of wild geese. These migrants began to visit us here in 1975. Why 1975? We don't know. At first, there were just a few individuals, but word must have gotten around because now there are nearly 23,000. Geese are very unusual in that they choose their mates for life. Even if their mate dies, they never remarry. Instead, they become solitary. Who would have thought that of a goose? They eat grains and seeds and have plenty of food. Flying on. Those who continue the journey will fly south to the marshes of the river Guadalquivir. The bustard also likes to hibernate here. It is the largest terrestrial bird in Europe. The male is considerably larger than the female something common to many species, and it weighs about 40 pounds. When spring comes, the bustards begin their courtship. They divide up into two groups, males on one side and females on the other. 
The males display their attributes, above all, their white feathers, and the more the better, hoping that a female will show interest. While the females consider their options, the male will take flight in order to fluff up his wings, like a crane lifting off for a long journey. There are many tribes in Papua New Guinea that had no contact with white men until 1935. Here in the highlands, neighboring tribes have not always got along. In fact, sometimes they get along very badly and there are constant battles and wars among them. These men belong to a tribe known as the Asaro Mudmen. The Asaro take advantage of the idea that guile may win over brute force, particularly when their warlike neighbors believe in ghosts and spirits. Most of these tribes believe in the spirits of the dead, in supernatural beings that live in the forest, and in other spirits called Domia that inhabit objects and may bring on bad luck. The mudmen's defense is a frightening mask. Here, they are forming them out of mud. They believe that these terrifying masks save their ancestors from a sure death. Some of them smear their masks with clay. And it looks like they're having fun. In addition to camouflaging, the mud does wonders for the skin. Then they tie tree branches to their waists. Some pig's teeth add to the disguise. And finally, a second layer of a different, more watery mud. This trick had its origins in an old man named Pukiro, who had a dream about some monstrous beings. The village was besieged by a large enemy tribe. Inspired by his dream, Pukiro ventured into the forest when the sun went down with a mud mask over his head and long claws made of bamboo shoots. When the enemy saw him emerging from the darkness, they fled in terror. It doesn't surprise me. They may look like carnival revelers in the light of day, but in the forest at night, they look like ghosts. It's easy to be surprised in the Caribbean as well. The word cenote comes from the word tsonot, in the language of the Mayas. Cenotes are found in Yucatan, Florida, and Cuba. Cenotes are filled with fresh water filtering in through surrounding limestone. This is a cenote on the island of Cuba. It's connected to the sea by a series of caves. At first, the water was half fresh and half salty, but as time passed, it got less and less salty, and the creatures that inhabit it had to adapt. They are strange creatures indeed. This one is a Kubanichthys, but it's easier to call it a blind fish. These exotic fish live in permanent darkness. They have no pigment and no eyes, since there is almost nothing to be seen where they live. Not much is known about them.
Although they are blind, they have nothing to fear. We do know that there are four species of blind fish. There they go with their dorsal fins to look round a bit at the bottom of the cenote. This is a shrimp, a delightful appetizer for the Kubanichthis. There's barely any light here and hardly any predators, but there's food. Although the fish can't see, it detects signals sent out by the shrimp. Like a pale shadow, it slowly glides towards its prey, safe in the knowledge that it won't be swallowed in a moment of carelessness. In Yucatan, there were sacred places. Some unfortunate people were unceremoniously thrown into them from high cliffs, and if they didn't die, they were considered gods. Today, they are great places for diving. Exploring their depths is an incredible experience, as long as you're not too disturbed by bones and legends. <laughs> <laughs>